right, good morning and welcome to STL History Live. My name is Aaron Pelker. I am a community engagement coordinator at the Missouri History Museum and I do wanna thank you for spending part of your Tuesday with us. Before we get to today's presentation on panoramas of the city, I'd like to make a couple of brief remarks. The first is to thank two key contributors to help that help make programs like this possible, city and county residents and their contributions through the Zoo Museum Tax District and our museum members. If you're already a member, thank you for your generosity. If you're not, but would like to learn more about the membership process, please check the chat feature on Zoom for a URL link to our membership page on our website. Next, I wanna take a moment to explain some of the features on Zoom. If you look at your toolbar on the Zoom app, you'll see two features I'd like to highlight, closed captioning and the Q&A feature. You can enable closed captioning by clicking on the CC box on your toolbar. After our presentation, which will last about 30 minutes, there will be about 10 minutes to ask questions of our presenter. You can use the Q&A dialog box on the Zoom app toolbar to submit those questions, but we do ask that you please wait until the end of the lecture to submit those questions, and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. Also, if you must leave the presentation early, we are recording to today's lecture, and it will eventually be made available on the Missouri Historical Society's YouTube channel. So with that, I'd like to introduce today's featured speaker, Adam Kloppy, public historian. So thanks for finding yourself here. Enjoy, and take it away, Adam. All right, well, thank you, Aaron. And uh, I just wanna echo what you said uh, to everybody. Thank you all so, so much for, um, for joining us today. Uh, it's really, I, I think it's so special that so many of you would wanna spend a part of your day learning about the history of this city. So thank you all so much for being here. Uh, my name is Adam Kloppy. I'm a public historian with the Missouri Historical Society. And my presentation today is called Panoramas of the City. And it's based off of uh, an exhibit we had at the Missouri History Museum a few years ago uh, called Panoramas of the City. Uh, many of you may, may have seen that exhibit. Uh, in that exhibit, we had um, several dozen panoramas, most of which we recreated at close to what their original size would have been at the time, say, you know, 14 inches long by five inches high or something like that. But we took seven of them and we blew them up as big as we possibly could uh, to be, you know, in some cases, 10 feet high and in other cases, 40 feet long. So these ended up being really sizable panoramas. And so people could essentially just walk through these panoramas and we pulled out interesting stories uh, for people uh, that you can see in the panoramas and that sort of surround the panoramas to give them greater context. Uh, and so today, in today's presentation, I'm going to be walking you through about five panoramas from St. Louis history, all from between 1900 and 1950. But what are panoramas and why do this? So panoramas, uh, for the context of this presentation and that exhibit, uh, are wide angle photographs, typically somewhere taken, you know, with a field of vision between 180 and 360 degrees. So offering you a full 180 degree view of a landscape or a group of people, or in some cases, a full 360 degree view. We don't have any 360 degree uh, panoramas in this presentation, but it's worth mentioning. Um, and why panoramas? Well, panoramas are an incredibly valuable historical resource. Um, you know, that we're going to be talking today about some events in St. Louis history that are pretty well known that you guys probably have already heard of a little bit. But what panoramas can do is show us even greater detail about these things that we thought we knew pretty well, or put a human face on an event that maybe just is something we read about in a textbook. You know, it can really put us in that moment. Uh, Panoramas also can show us historical events that have been nearly forgotten about. I don't know about you guys, but you know, when I pull out my iPhone to take a panorama of something, it's usually because I'm somewhere that I want to remember, or I'm at an event that I don't think I'm ever going to be at an event like that again. And I want to take a panorama to really capture the scale of why I was there. And people, you know, 50, 100, years ago, they didn't have, you know, obviously cell phones that had panoramic cameras in them. But when they called out panoramic photographers to take pictures, or when panoramic photographers themselves went out to take panoramas, it was for very similar reasons. It's because they thought this is an event worth capturing. This is an event that people are going to want to remember. This is an event for commercial photographers that they thought 
maybe people want to say they were there and they'll buy prints from me. So we can look back and really see what kind of events were important to those people as they were living through them, even if they've sort of been lost to history today. So let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, our first panorama we're going to talk about uh, was taken of the St. Louis Riverfront around 1903. Uh, we think around 1903 based on both the steamboats we can see on the levee and the buildings you can see uh, on the St. Louis Riverfront there. Uh, and of course, most of these buildings are gone today, the Gateway Arch, everything south of the Eads Bridge, most of those buildings were taken down except for a select few and uh, to make way for the Gateway Arch. I'm going to pan through this panorama for a little bit here. I do want to apologize for the image quality. Uh, the better quality scans had ended up breaking my PowerPoint. I'm pretty computer illiterate. So I apologize for that. Uh, that lack of quality when I pan through. But if you do want to uh, look at this image in better quality, please visit our website, mohistory.org, and search our collections. All these panoramas are on there, and you can spend some time looking through them. Uh, but like I said, this panorama is taken sometime around 1903. We know it's taken in the first decade of the 20th century. And this is a time of great change in St. Louis. And it's due to that bridge you can see in the panorama right there. Uh, the Eads Bridge, of course, was completed in 1874. And it had started to change St. Louis. All of a sudden, St. Louis is connected to the east in this really uh, convenient way that it hadn't been before. You know, before that, the only way to get across the river was by ferry. Um, and steamboat trade really dominated St. Louis. It was how people got to St. Louis and how goods got to St. Louis. Let's pan through that again. Um, and so, you know, those steamboats dominated the economy, it dominated travel in St. Louis. Uh, but just because the Eads Bridge was completed in the 1870s, that didn't mean that overnight rail became more important than steam travel. It took several years. It took until the first decade of the 20th century for rail travel and trade in St. Louis to overtake steam travel and trade. So this panorama really shows a moment of great transition in the history of St. Louis. And all the steamboats you, see, you saw on the levee there, they all have stories. But my favorite one is this one right here. This is a detail from the panorama with better quality because it's just one little detail. Um, but this steamboat is obviously named the Mark Twain. Uh, the Mark Twain was named that in 1902. Uh, and the Mark Twain was the city of St. Louis's harbor boat. Harbor boats essentially uh, helped ferry passengers and their baggage, sometimes goods, from ship to shore. If a, if a ship couldn't get a spot on the levee, uh, they would direct boats where to go, where open spots might go. They basically were a lot of people's introduction to the city of St. Louis. If they were traveling here by steamboat, that interaction with the harbor boat may have been the first interaction they had with St. Louis. And prior to 1902, the city of St. Louis's harbor boat was not named the Mark Twain. I believe it was named the city of St. Louis. And in anticipation of the World's Fair, the city of St. Louis wanted to give the boat a more exciting name. And so they decided they wanted to name it the Mark Twain. And they sent a letter to Mark Twain, uh, Samuel Clemens, asking him if he would like to come to the naming ceremony of this boat knowing full well when they sent that, that he was planning on being in Missouri in the summer of 1902. He was actually getting an honorary doctorate in June of 1902 from the University of Missouri. So they knew he would be around. They invited him to the ceremony and Twain agreed. So in June of 1902, Mark Twain is in St. Louis for this naming ceremony. There's all these, you know, reporters and uh, political dignitaries, elected officials at the naming ceremony. They break the bottle on the ship. They name it the Mark Twain. And then everybody gets on the steamboat for a little harbor cruise that was going to go up to the Chain of Rocks Bridge and then back down. Um, and, you know, as they're on this boat, Mark Twain is making his way through, sort of hobnobbing with people, answering reporters' questions. And eventually he makes his way up to the pilot house, where the pilot of the boat asks him if he would like to steer the ship. And Twain agrees. Uh, and everyone kind of goes crazy over this. It's this big moment. Here's Mark Twain steering a steamboat on the river that made him famous. There's even illustrations of this moment in the newspaper the next day. I guess there might not have been a camera on the boat at the time, but this was in a lot of the St. Louis City newspapers the day after that ceremony. And Twain even mentions uh, as he leaves the pilot house, he said that's probably going to be his last time piloting a boat on the Mississippi. But what he didn't know, what no one else in that crowd knew, is that's really the last known trip that Twain would take on the Mississippi River. After that naming ceremony was over, he spent a few more days in St. Louis. We have no evidence that he boarded another steamboat here. Then he went up to Hannibal, 
for a few days, spent some time with family up there. We have no evidence he went on a steamboat there. And then he left Missouri. He went back to his home on the East Coast, and he died there several years later without ever making it back to this part of the country. So the last known steamboat trip that Mark Twain takes on the Mississippi River, again, the river that made him famous, is right here in St. Louis on a boat that bore his name. And that's a story that I didn't know before our team started researching these panoramas for that exhibit. Those are the kinds of stories that uh, really panoramas can show us and can help us to recover. Uh, but, you know, like I mentioned, this is a moment of great transition in St. Louis, that first decade of the 20th century. And a lot of it has to do with the Eads Bridge there. The Eads Bridge, when it's completed in the 1870s, is considered an architectural marvel. There were many people who thought it was going to be impossible to build a bridge across a river as mighty as the Mississippi uh, in St. Louis. Uh, many St. Louisans didn't trust the bridge, even as it was going up, and James Eads uh, and uh, other people at a stake in the bridge had to sort of devise these uh, stunts to convince people the bridge would hold, including walking elephants across the bridge and things like this. Um, but after it's built, people come to St. Louis just to see this bridge. It's this marvel. And it, it's not just an architectural marvel. It actually changes people's daily lives in St. Louis. It connects them to the East in ways that they hadn't even dreamed possible before. It makes their lives, you know, it makes traveling to Illinois for, you know, to visit family or to trade goods or to go to a shop of their, whatever it is, it makes it a little bit easier. And we talk about that a lot as historians, but what I love about panoramas like this is that you can actually see in this detail from the panorama four different ways that the Eads Bridge was changing people's lives. Of course, if you look, there's a little white plume of smoke about in the middle of the bridge. And if you look uh, to the right of that, sort of on the in the middle part of the bridge there, you can see a train that's stretching, that plume of smoke is coming from the engine of the train as it's traveling west across the river. If you look just above that plume of smoke, you can see a streetcar traveling across the top of the bridge. Then if you look, in our view, a couple inches to the left of that, you can actually see a horse and a carriage traveling across the bridge as well. If you look really closely between that horse and carriage, and that streetcar, you can also see people walking across that bridge. Those are things that people would have thought were impossible dreams just about 30 years before this panorama was taken. And by the time it was taken, these modes of travel and trade were changing St. Louis in ways that no one had really even considered before. Okay, I need to speed up or I'm not gonna get through all five of these. Uh, our next panorama that we're gonna talk about is uh, the League of Women, uh, panorama of the League of Women Voters that was taken on September 13th of 1920. And this is a pretty significant panorama because this is taken on the first day that women could register to vote in the city of St. Louis. The League of Women Voters uh, was a national organization. They had a chapter here in St. Louis. Uh, they were created out of the National American Women's Suffrage Association uh, as the 19th Amendment was about to be ratified. So when it became clear that the 19th Amendment was going to be ratified, that group changed its focus, not from fighting to get women the right, uh, the right to vote, but instead getting women to practice the right to vote. And the League of Women Voters in St. Louis, let's pan through that again, the League of Women Voters in St. Louis thought they should hold a parade and a rally on the first day those polling places were open on September 13th to encourage women to come out to register to vote. Now the city of St. Louis anticipated that about 60,000 women would register to vote uh, on the four days that polling places were open for them to register. You can see those four dates on those posters that people are holding. And so to, uh, to advertise this, the League of Women Voters held a parade and a rally in St. Louis. They started at Lyndall and Grand and they had all these cars decked out with decorations for one for every ward in the city and one for every state that had ratified the 19th Amendment. They wound their way through the streets of St. Louis and along the way, along the way they picked up elected officials and people like that. They stopped in front of the old post office, which is the building behind them in the panorama there and for a rally where those politicians and uh, the leadership of the League of Women Voters spoke to voters. Uh, and one of the leaders of the League of Women Voters here in St. Louis is this woman, who you can spot in the panorama. Her name is Edna Gellhorn, uh, and she was a prominent suffragist in St. Louis. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with the Walkless Talkless Parade that was held during the 1916 Democratic Convention here in St. Louis, where women silently lined the streets uh, holding yellow umbrellas uh, and sort of stared down uh, the Democratic 
uh, party politicians that were going between their hotels and the uh, convention space in order to demonstrate the political power of women that had been silenced by denying them the right to vote. Their hopes were that the Democrats would endorse giving women the vote on their 1916 uh, platform, which they did. Um, and Gellhorn was an important, uh, she helped organize that, uh, that event, and she also was an important figure nationally. She was a recognized suffragist nationally, and in fact, when the League of Women uh, Voters was created, she was asked to be one of the first presidents of that organization. She actually turned down that leadership position to stay active in St. Louis. Instead, she held a different leadership position with the League of Women Voters nationally, uh, but she was the president of the League of Women Voters here in Missouri and she uh, and in St. Louis and she helped to organize that parade and rally um, that the panorama comes from and one of her, her goal wasn't just to get women to come out to register to vote that's of course very important but one of her goals is also to teach women how to vote and that sounds kind of condescending to say but the, you can see this little advertisement on your screen right there and uh, it, it's for uh, an amendment to the Missouri Constitution to fund uh, improving Missouri roads for, you know, the rapid, the rapid increase in popularity of the automobile, to get more roads automobile safe and automobile friendly. And this advertisement is encouraging people to vote yes on that amendment. And you can see on the advertisement, in order to vote yes, you didn't circle yes, you didn't put a check next to yes, you didn't fill in a box next to yes, you actually scratched through the word no and you left yes blank. It was what was called a scratch ballot. It's what Missouri used at the time. And when our team was researching this exhibit, what I like to say was, you know, if you had put me in a time machine and whisked me back to 1920, and even if you had told me to research all the issues on the Missouri ballot at that time, if you had asked me, vote for the things that you think should pass in 1920, you put me in a ballot box, I would have voted wrong on absolutely everything. That, that idea of a scratch ballot seems kind of counterintuitive to me. That, not, that would not have been how I would have thought to vote yes for something. So Edna Gellhorn had to make sure that people actually knew how to fill out their ballots correctly so they could be counted. Um, and the city of St. Louis, you know, she was hoping to get 60,000 people uh, to register to vote. And that's what the city of St. Louis uh, was aiming for. And they missed their target a little bit. They actually ended up with 120,000 women that registered to vote over the first four days that the uh, polling places were open to them. Uh, and of course, newspapers sent uh, reporters down to those polling places to try to get stories of women uh, who were registering to vote for the first time. There was a lot of interest in older women, you know, people 90 plus who were uh, registering to vote for the first time. You see another picture there where there's four generations of women uh, showing up, three of whom are old enough to register to vote. Of course, that little baby there probably isn't old enough. Um, and then, of course, the story at the top, uh, which was one of my favorite stories from the entire ex Panorama's exhibit of Ebby Tolbert. Um, the headline there says she was 113 years old. Census uh, information that we have sort of disagrees with that. Uh, she wasn't literate, and so different census takers cited her age at different numbers depending on the census. But we're pretty sure she was over 100 um, by the time that she registered to vote on September 14th of 1920. And at the very least, we know that she was born a slave um, uh, and then escaped to St. Louis during the Civil War and had lived here since the 1860s and then was finally registering to vote in 1920. And I think that's an incredibly powerful story. I can't imagine uh, the emotion that must have been going through Ebby Tolbert's mind as she stepped in, into that polling place in 1920 uh, after, after having her political voice silenced for her entire life for a hundred years uh, and then finally gaining that right to vote. I can't imagine what must have been going through her head in that moment. Um, okay, so uh, now we're going to jump ahead of time again a little bit. We're going to talk about a rally that was held for Charles Lindbergh on June 19th of 1927. Uh, this is, of course, about a month after Lindbergh's historic flight across the Atlantic Ocean. He uh, was the first person to fly solo nonstop across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and he landed in Paris on May 21st of 1927. I'm going to scan through this panorama here. Lindbergh is right at the very beginning of the scan, so don't miss him. He's sitting uh, on the dais right there. But um, of course, Lindbergh was celebrated all over the world after his flight to Paris. There was parades thrown throne forum that he attended in Paris, in London, in Washington, D.C., in New York, and of course, in St. Louis. Lindbergh was not a St. Louisan. 
but at the time of his flight across the Atlantic, he was operating as an airmail pilot uh, out of St. Louis, flying a route between St. Louis and Chicago. And all of his major financial backers were people uh, invested in aviation and business here in St. Louis. So Lindbergh had deep ties to this city and uh, wanted to thank the city and wanted to thank his backers for uh, backing that flight. So, and of course his plane was named the Spirit of St. Louis. So uh, there was a parade and rally thrown here in St. Louis. And Lindbergh becomes a much more controversial figure later in his career for comments that he made uh, sort of in the lead up to World War II that are today considered quite anti-Semitic uh, and that he, uh, that caused a lot of controversy for him and sort of uh, get people today to view Lindbergh in a different light. But this panorama is taken long before any of those comments were made when Lindbergh was still a global hero to millions. And after that flight, he truly was. He was the most photographed and perhaps the most idolized person on the planet. Uh, so on June 18th of 1927, the day before that panorama was taken, there was a massive parade that was held for Charles Lindbergh on the streets of downtown St. Louis. Uh, the estimation was that around 500,000 people lined the streets of downtown St. Louis for that parade. You can see uh, right there the car that Lindbergh was traveling in during that parade. Uh, and you can imagine all those people on the street you might not have even caught a glimpse of Lindbergh, even if you were there. The car was drove, you know, drove by, you only had a few seconds to see him, and there's all these people standing around. It was probably quite hard to get a view, but that's how desperate people were to say that they were there, that they were able to see Charles Lindbergh. Um, and then, of course, the next day on June 19th of 1927, there was that massive rally on Art Hill that the panorama shows. 100,000 people showed up to that rally for a chance. Uh, to do a couple of things. One was to see the spirit of St. Louis fly. You can see in that picture on the right there, um, the, there's several little dots in the sky. Uh, that's because there was a flyover of the crowd that uh, featured the spirit of St. Louis and several other aircraft owned by pilots and uh, military personnel here in the St. Louis area. Uh, and they did a flyover of the crowd. Um, and then Lindbergh landed the spirit of St. Louis at a small airfield in Forest Park. He was uh, transported to Art Hill, where after many politicians gave speeches, Lindbergh himself got up to speak. Later on in his career, he would become quite a gifted orator. Uh, that was not true of his time, uh, you know, about a month after his flight, he was still quite shy, still didn't really know how to handle his fame. Um, and so instead of giving a rousing speech about uh, the potential for air travel, he gave the entire crowd that's standing in the June heat in St. Louis a math problem about how much more efficient air travel is than rail travel. Um, people really didn't bother solving that math problem. Uh, they did clap politely for him and they cheered as Lindbergh walked up. Uh, there was a path made in the crowd, so he walked through that and placed a wreath at the base of the statue of St. Louis at the top of Art Hill to thank the city for everything they had done for him. But, you know, like I said, people were really excited to see Charles Lindbergh during this. And we can say that all we want, but I really think there's a detail from this panorama that illustrates this beautifully. This is a detail from the panorama from the art museum. And if you look, there, those little figures on the art museum, there, those are people sitting on a ledge, you know, 20 feet up at the art museum, you know, hundreds and hundreds of feet away from Lindbergh, just for the chance to hear him speak, to say that they were there, to say that they saw him. I don't even really know how they got up there. I assume there's a door somewhere up there, but you still have to do some climbing and wriggling around to get to that spot on the art museum. I imagine that's probably pretty dangerous. I can't imagine they let people do that today. And, but this is the lengths that people were going to just for a chance to say that they saw Lindbergh, to say that they saw this guy who really changed the world in 1927 and made the world seem just a little bit smaller. Oh man, I really do have to hurry now. Um, the next panorama I'm going to talk about is, uh, was taken on either November 15th or 16th of 1930 of a group called the League of Struggle for Negro Rights. Um, this was a communist organization, a national communist organization in the United States uh, that only operated for a few years between 1930 and 1936. They had quite small membership at about 20,000. You also have to remember that this is an era, you know, before you know, the great red scares in the 50s. There were smaller red scares before that, but 
you know, communism wasn't quite the dirty word it would become later in 1930. It just wasn't, it wasn't viewed that way. And you also have to remember this is a period of the depression, the early days of the depression. A lot of people are looking for alternative solutions for ways to maybe fix the economy and fix American society that seems like it's sort of in a lot of trouble. So what's interesting about this meeting of the League of Struggle for Negro Rights is that they're actually founded at this meeting. They were part of a different, a much larger uh, communist organization in the United States. This was an anti-lynching delegation, a delegation concerned with passing federal anti-lynching legislation um, of that larger communist group. That larger group, though, was falling apart in 1930. So this group decided they wanted to stay together and they reformed themselves as this new independent organization called the League of Struggle for Negro Rights. And they fought for things like passing a federal anti-lynching bill. Uh, they fought for breaking up large Southern land holdings and giving those lands to black sharecroppers in the South. They fought against Jim Crow laws and things like this. this and their first meeting was held right here in St. Louis in the Mill Creek Valley, which you can see uh, from several years later. The Mill Creek Valley was one of the largest African-American neighborhoods in St. Louis at the time this panorama was taken in 1930. It was still one of the largest African-American neighborhoods in St. Louis about 20 years later in the 1950s. However, during that decade, city leaders uh, caught up in sort of the urban renewal craze. They thought that this area would be a prime area to redevelop. So they actually had this area all declared a slum. They had the, the residents in that neighborhood relocated and then most of the neighborhood, if not all of it, was raised. There were a few select buildings that were saved, but pretty much everything else was wiped out. And that, that doesn't just include homes, that includes banks and movie theaters and churches and schools and shops. You know, it was, this was a thriving neighborhood. Um, and, you know, after all those buildings went away, this area was not called the Mill Creek Valley anymore. It was actually renamed as Hiroshima Flats, sort of colloquially by pe people in St. Louis. Because it looked like a bomb had gone off. That was the level of destruction that was done in this neighborhood. The promise was once all these buildings were raised, a new neighborhood would come up in this area with you know, glittering new facilities and state-of-the-art buildings and all these kinds of things. That didn't really come to pass. This area sort of sat vacant for many, many years. And today, it, the Mill Creek Valley is sort of the eastern half of SLU's campus, the part that's east of Grand, stretching west to about uh, where the Wells Fargo campus is today. And for a now and then comparison, uh, this picture on the left is, was taken in 1928 in the Mill Creek Valley. Uh, if you look in that picture, there's sort of two buildings in the background. The one on the right was sort of the interesting, I'm not an architectural historian, so I don't know the name for it, but sort of the interesting stonework around the doorway. Uh, that's actually the building where that League of Struggle for Negro Rights meeting was held. Um, so that's what that looked like around the time that the panorama was taken. If you look on the right, that's what's there today. It's the Wells Fargo campus. And you know, Wells Fargo, of course, ha creates a lot of jobs in this area. It brings in a lot of money to this area, but that's a much different looking neighborhood. That's a much different looking, uh, a much different idea of what it means to use space in a city than what the Mill Creek Valley had been uh, before. Uh, I do want to point out one detail in this panorama before we move on. I'm sure as many of you noticed, a lot of the crowd were holding signs um, in that panorama. One of the signs uh, is this one. It's tough to read even here, but what that sign says is demand the release of the Atlanta Six. The Atlanta Six were a group of activists in Atlanta, Georgia, that had been arrested earlier in 1930. And they were arrested by the state of Georgia for passing out what the state of Georgia deemed to be insurrectionary literature. And they said it was insurrectionary because it threatened Jim Crow laws. And the specific thing that the state of Georgia cited that said that they said it was threatening those laws was an image on the front of a pam the pamphlet they were handing out, an image that showed a black man and a white man shaking hands. So these six activists were arrested and thrown in jail. Their case never went to trial thanks to groups like the League of Struggle for Negro Rights, thanks to groups like the ACLU. But if it had gone before a judge and if they had been found guilty, one of the potential uh, penalties for passing out insurrectionary literature in Georgia at that time was death. Those activists could have been put to death for passing out that pamphlet. So knowing that story of the Atlanta Six a little bit makes another detail from the panorama very important, and it's this one. This is a detail from the other side of the panorama from this sign that says demand the release of the Atlanta Six. And in this detail, you can see a black man and a white man shaking hands. When our team was first working in this panorama, I don't think any of us really noticed this detail of a black man and a white man shaking hands. This did not look like 
something notable to us today. But knowing the story of the Atlanta Six, knowing that in another state in the United States there were activists that have been thrown in jail with the potential to be put to death just for passing out a pamphlet that showed this act, for these two men to pose for a camera, this isn't you know, that someone just capturing a moment, they're posing for the camera like this. And for them to pose in, in this way, in this moment, is incredibly significant. It's incredibly powerful. And it really shows the type of world that groups like the League of Struggle or Negro, of Negro Rights were trying to build, uh, a world with more racial equality uh, than the one uh, that they had in front of them. I am running over time, so we're gonna rush through this one. I really apologize to all you baseball fans out there. Um, so the last panorama I'm gonna talk about is was taken at Sportsman's Park on July 4th of 1941. Um, at the time, of course, St. Louis was home to two major league baseball teams, the Cardinals and the Browns. Neither of them are shown in this panorama. This panorama, the first game of a doubleheader that was held on July 4th of 1941. Uh, and both games of those doubleheaders featured uh, Negro Leagues teams, teams with all black players. This was the first time ever that Sportsman's Park had welcomed two Negro Leagues teams to play against each other at Sportsman's Park, and the first time in 20 years that any black players had taken the field at Sportsman's Park. Um, and of course, as we all know, probably baseball was a segregated sport um, until Jackie Robinson broke the color line in baseball in 1947. But in St. Louis, baseball was also a segregated game for fans. Sportsman's Park in St. Louis was the only baseball stadium in Major League Baseball that had an official segregationist seating policy. Other baseball teams and other baseball stadiums had unofficial uh, uh, segregationist seating policies, but the city of uh, Sportsman's Park had it written into how their ticket sellers did their jobs, that black fans could only buy tickets in certain sections. Um, those policies were very much relaxed for this doubleheader. Um, the first game of the doubleheader was actually a game between two industrial league teams here in St. Louis, uh, the St. Louis Steel Mules and the Skullin uh, Titanium Giants. Uh, or I might have, it might be the Skull and Steel Mules and the St. Louis Titanium Giants, I don't remember. Um, but, <laughs> um, you know, these were two all black industrial teams here in St. Louis. They played a five inning game. So that's actually the game you see in the panorama. These are two details from the panorama. One with uh, detail of, you can see the uniform, that is the uniform of the St. Louis Titanium Giants. And then the scoreboard shows they're in the fourth inning and they played a five inning game that day. And then the real draw was a second game between the Kansas City Monarchs and the Chicago American Giants. The Kansas City Monarchs were, were led by one of the most popular baseball players in the world, black or white at this time, Satchel Paige. Uh, people flocked to come see him play wherever he was. He was a dominant pitcher and uh, really a showman on the mound too. He loved to put on a show and really entertain people who came out to see him. Uh, so, you know, thousands and thousands of people came out to, to see uh, Satchel Paige play. And this game was such a success that um, in the future, more and more games featuring Negro Leagues teams were played at Sportsman's Park uh, to the point that in 1944, Saint, uh, Sportsman's Park did away with its segregationist seating policy entirely. So, um, and then of course, I like to end this little presentation by talking about panoramas today. I mentioned earlier, if you have a smartphone, your phone probably has a setting that allows you to take panoramas. And these are two that I took. One when I was on a tour at the Anheuser-Busch uh, facility with uh, my in-laws who had never been there before and I wanted to, to sort of capture that moment. And then um, the other here at the bottom uh, was from the eclipse a few years ago. You know, and people like to pull out panoramas for stuff like this. And I'm sure if you look through your own phone, you probably have panoramas in there that you've taken. So I often like to say that, you know, panoramas might be a valuable historic resource for us today. But if we all keep taking them in another hundred years, people, another one, someone else could do a presentation like this one or an exhibit like the one that we did using our panoramas that we're taking today to show the kinds of things uh, that are important, um, that were important in our own time. Okay, so that's sort of the end of my presentation here. Um, let's see, I need to find out how I can oh, uh, view the questions. Give me one second, everybody. Um, I need to Q&A, okay. Um, so one question that I'm seeing here from Martin uh, says that the riverfront panorama shows a lot of uh, coal uh, smoke, a lot of you know, uh, um, coal smoke air pollution, which we rarely see today. 
Um, and that's true. You know, uh, there, there was a lot more uh, sort of pollutants in the air uh, from, you know, factories and other businesses like that in St. Louis, the sort of environmental standards uh, were, were a little bit different at the turn of the century than they might be today. And, uh, you know, one thing, it, that's a great thing to notice. And one thing I thought was really interesting, uh, some of you who came to the Panorama's exhibit may have seen above the entryway, we had a panorama uh, that we had sort of altered in some ways. We took that riverfront panorama from back then and we got a panoramic photographer today to take a panorama from that same spot on uh, the eastern shore of the Mississippi of downtown with a camera that has, you know, quite a bit more power than the type of camera they would have used uh, back then. And, uh, you know, you could, you could see, the, you could read the clock on Union Station in that new panorama. Like, it, it, it was a very powerful image. And of course, some of that has to do, like I said, with the lens he's using, but some of it also has to do with the way the air has been since then, right? Your sort of span of visibility is gonna be a little bit more if the air is cleaner, if there's not coal smoke and things like that. You can't even really make out uh, buildings much more than a few blocks off the riverfront uh, in that panorama. So it really does go to show how much those sort of uh, environmental, um, you know, uh, regulations and things like that we've passed have really cleaned up our air. Um, another question that I'm seeing uh, is one asking how panoramic cameras back then worked because they worked a little different. Cell phones work today. Um, you know, when you take your cell phone to use a panorama, you usually stand like this or and you move your arms or you move your whole body in sort of an arc and you take this panorama of a landscape. Um, or a group of people or whatever you're taking the panorama of. And what your phone is doing is actually taking a bunch of different images all at once and stitching them together. It's using it, the programming within the camera app on your phone to stitch those uh, images together to make one continuous image. That's not the way that panoramic cameras though worked at um, the turn of the century and up through the 50s when the, you know, the panoramas we were talking about. How those typically worked was it was a camera that was sitting on a tripod uh, and both the camera and the tripod had gears on them, gears that the photographer uh, using specialized knowledge would know how to manipulate to change the degree of the panorama you're taking. Uh, you know, 180 degrees, 360 degrees, whatever it is. Uh, now one gear would actually rotate the box of the camera. So, you know, if my hands here are the camera, if you guys can see me, and it would move like this in a little arc. Another set of gears would pull film through that camera the opposite way. So as the camera is moving, different parts of the film are being exposed to what's out there. Um, and uh, so as these, um, so, you know, as the camera is moving, it's continuously taking that image. Uh, and I'm sure some of you noticed, like in the Lindbergh panorama, there's some blurring and stuff on the stage because someone was moving a lot as that lens was on them. It created a lot of blurring. And that's one of the reasons we know in the League of struggle for Negro rights panorama that they're posing for that. If they had been moving a lot while they were taking that panorama, uh, the image would have blurred and it would have been um, probably, you know, not as clear. So, you know, those cameras worked kind of on the same principle. You're on the arc. You're still getting the same distortion you might see in panoramas today, where in the middle things get look closer to the camera and everything's sort of warped outwards, even though it was all flat line before. It's that same distortion kind of, but they just operated mechanically a little bit different. I'm seeing, we have another question here from Lindsay. Hi, Lindsay. Um, uh, and this question is, uh, is the 1903 panorama the oldest photographic one MHS, MHS has, or are there older ones? And that's a really great question. Um, so we do have older photographs in our collection that you might consider panoramas. I believe though that one is the oldest one that we have. It's taken with a panoramic camera. I might be off there might be one that's a little older, but I believe that one's the oldest. Um, but most of the ones we have from before this are actually done using a different method. We have one of an image that says it's a panoramic image that's taken in the St. Louis Riverfront, I believe in the 1860s, it might be the 1870s. Um, but either way, how that done, it was a glass plate photograph and as the photographer, he took several images of the riverfront and then you know, when he was developing the actual photograph, he just laid those glass plates over each other. And it's sort of an image, it's five different images or six different images that have been blended together to create a panorama. 
And people were doing that for ever since the camera had really been invented in the mid 19th century, up until panoramic cameras were really invented in the mid 1890s. So people had sort of been using what, uh, they, were, what they had to create panoramic images, uh, even if they, uh, you know, they weren't necessarily what we might consider panoramas today. Uh, Mary here uh, is asking a question. She says, are there any panoramas from the 1904 World's Fair? And actually there are. Uh, there's, we had one in the um, panorama show. It was not one that we blew up. Um, it was one of the smaller ones because it had unfortunately some damage to it, uh, that, it that the photograph had received before we, we were able to get it and preserve it. But uh, it was someone who, according to the caption on the photograph, and we have no reason to doubt this caption, but according to that caption, it was a panorama that was taken on the Ferris wheel at the World's Fair. And so it's sort of showing a bird's eye view of the World's Fair from the perspective of one of the cars on the Ferris wheel. And of course, it's very interesting to us as historians. Um, and it's, I think it's a really fascinating photograph. I, World's Fair is endlessly fascinating. But it's also, you know, if you're not really into the World's Fair, it's not the most exciting image. It's a lot of, you can't really see any people. It's mostly the tops of buildings and stuff like that that you're seeing, you know, the undecorated parts of a lot of buildings. So it's, it's of a lot of interest, I think, to those of us who are interested in the World's Fair, but sort of a, from a dynamic um, visual perspective, it might not be, you know, the best panorama uh, to have blown up. But it was in there for people to explore. I'm not sure if it's digitized on our website yet or not, but it, I'd certainly encourage you to go check. Um, do we have any other questions? Anybody else have a question they want to get in? And I, you know, I do want to say too, uh, you know, this, the, um, you know, the stories I've told today about these panoramas are not the, they don't even scratch the surface of the kinds of things you can learn from panoramas, even from the ones I've shown. There are tons of stories hidden in here that I just didn't have the time uh, to get to, tons of little details that I would have loved to uh, point out, you know, uh, you know, children, stuff in the League of Struggle for Negro Rights panorama that I just didn't have time to touch on today. Um, we have a question here. Uh, were these early panoramas printed on paper or some other material? Um, it just sort of depended, you know, the prints that photographers were making to sell. It just sort of depended on what they had available. It's usually like photographic paper or something like that. Um, but, you know, what's interesting, a lot of the panoramas that we have in our collection are actually panoramas of sort of uh, soldiers down at um, uh, Jefferson Barracks and stuff as they're getting ready to go to World War I and things like that, uh, you know, and they're moving through St. Louis. Panoramic photographers, they knew if they went down there and took a panorama of, you know, some unit, they, when they develop it, they could go back down there and tell these guys, hey, you should send a photo of yourself and your unit home to your sweetheart, home to your parents or whatever. I'll sell these prints for you to a dollar, for a dollar. So a lot of panoramic photographers would go down there and take photos of these soldiers and then they would, the soldiers would buy them, send them home, and then they would end up in our collection. So we, you know, we have a lot of uh, panoramas that sort of, they look similar, even if they all tell these very different stories. But to answer your question, most of them are printed on kind of photographic paper. And I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what that would have been called back then. So. Anything else? Okay, okay. if there's no other questions, Aaron? Well, thanks again for everyone for attending today's STL History Live. Thanks to Adam, of course, for that fascinating look at panoramas of the city. Uh, your feedback is always important to us, so we would really appreciate it if you could take our short survey a Kobo toolbox survey should have opened in one of your browser tabs, so please keep an eye out for that when we end the session. Uh, thanks again, and remember that you can find the full schedule of STL History Live on the Missouri Historical Society website, mohistory.org, and our Facebook page. But please join us next time on Thursday, June 11th at 6.30 p.m. for our next lecture titled Black Music Spotlight with the National Museum of African American Music. So thanks again and enjoy the rest of your day.